Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Edgerson from Happiness is Egg Shape. And today I am joined by a man mountain. This guy has been and seen and done it all and he's got heaps of stories to tell. I absolutely love being in his company, even when he throws coffee all over me, but that's a story for another day. He is the one and the only, he's already laughing, Mr. Nathan Hines. Hello, sir. Hi, mate. How are you? You can tell yeah. a story if you want. That was a total accident. So it was, a, it was a sign of affection. I was trying to give you a hug and saying hi, but I didn't realise you had coffee in your hand. So. Yeah, I, I do like it, though, because now I can tell people that Nathan Hines threw coffee over me, and then it, it makes it sound like I'm quite cool because Nathan Hines knows who I am. Are you turning to Jim Hamilton, just making up a story or, or, you know, making a story sound like another story to make it sound cool? <laughs> that's that's what happens when you become yeah. a podcaster. You just talk yeah. absolute rubbish. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> well, to be fair, both of you talk rubbish before you're podcasters, so you're, you know. That's, that? that's, that's very honing, true. Honing your, your school, school before. <laughs> <then>. <laughs> All right. Tell people what you're doing now. What's your job? What is my job? Sometimes I question what it is. Um, I, I work at Gallagher Insurance. Um, when I finished the Montpellier coaching, I came back to UK. Didn't have, I didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, Gallagher, uh, you know, were title partners of the Premiership. Uh, Gallagher needed someone who knew rugby to head that up. Had other relationships between all the rugby clubs and were brokers for all the clubs and PRL. So um, they looked for someone who knew some stuff about rugby. They couldn't find anyone, asked if I'd do it. Um, and basically it's uh, growing the business and keeping the business with our rights as, as title partner from a premiership rugby as well as, um, you know, wider business development um, role, which is uh, which is good, keeps me busy. Not out of trouble, but it just keeps me busy. Did you know anything about business? I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, no. A little bit. I knew how to use computer. And I think you know what you know. So like he, um, most things can be can be learned. I think that being and everything's sort of relationship based. You know what I mean? You're not going to do business with people you don't trust, you don't like, who you can't get along with. That's why no one does business with me. Um, but the um, I think the, the, the thing is, when you play rugby, um, well, especially for the 40 years I did, you learn how to talk to people that you don't know, you don't know how to, you know, find out about their family and, and what they do and what they, you know, there, there's a common thread of rugby that runs through what, what you're talking about and, and why you connected, really. There's no different, really, what I do now. It's kind of a, whether it's, it's all a relationship, whether it's internally with the people I work with, um, or externally and the beauty of it is that if I go to a game with clients um, or potential clients that they they like rugby and we can we can chat about that so um, yeah all the other stuff I, I'm, I'm picking up on like how to take a holiday and that kind of thing <laughs> no, no where Easter is <laughs> well yeah I was saying to your fair before like it was the last last Easter. I'll oh, know this year, but last Easter it was the it was Thursday before Good Friday, and I was speaking to our um, one of our brokers in in um, in Bristol, and I said, "Mate, why is it so hard to get hold of each anyone this week?" And he goes, "Oh, because it's two four day weeks." And I'm like, two four day weeks." I know it's Good Friday tomorrow, but is there a holiday next week? And he goes, "Easter Monday." And I was like, "Oh yeah," but you know, in rugby, Monday is recovery and. Uh, review day and Friday's team run day normally. So it doesn't matter what, if it's a public holiday, bank holiday, Easter, Christmas usually is okay. But um, even then, sometimes you train. So, yeah, it took a bit of adjusting, to be fair, actually. See, I, I've got no doubt you're always going to be good at what you do. You're one of those guys that's going to make it happen. But you obviously had no clue what you're going to do when you finished playing rugby or coaching. Uh, yeah, well, coaching, no, but the same thing happened Um I was lucky where I had um, a two-year contract at sale um, and then Vern asked me, and oh, well, to be fair, I didn't know. I got injured in my first first three games at sale. I could tore my bicep tendon. And that took three months to get back. And then I was like, well, do I do I suck the funds out of sale sharks for another year and take up a, a, a bench spot probably in, in, in optim optimistically? Um, 
or Vern said, you know, would you like to come and help me with Scotland? Um, so it sort of evolved organically, really, and I didn't, didn't have to choose. But um, I think that's how my career sort of went generally. Like, I, I didn't come to Scotland for to play rugby professionally. I came for six months to play for Gala and then went to go back, wanted to go, or well, planned to go back, ended up working hard, working hard and had a good year at Gala, then went to Edinburgh and worked hard and, and got capped before I, in, in 2000. And it sort of just evolved, everything sort of evolved organically, but I just, you know, a lot of hard work in it, in it as well. But, um, and then the coaching came up, worked really hard at that. Most of the boys in Scotland say so I was rubbish anyway at it. So, um, but I did work hard. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then went to Montpellier, but um, yeah. I, like I didn't really know what I was going to do. I knew I could coach when I came back here, but I didn't want to stay in France. The Montpellier experience was a bit of a, a bit, a bit rubbish, to be fair, in the end. Um, and uh, my daughter's got dyslexia, and and she couldn't read. She was seven, couldn't read or write, and, and um, she was going to bilingual school, which wasn't good for her. So we kind of wanted to move back for that, really, and then left it open to what we're going to do, um, and then Gallagher. Um, well, Hugh Vivian, actually, who had this job before me, asked me. I'm not quite sure whether he asked me just because he wanted to get another job in Gallagher and there was no one else about, but uh, or he actually thought I was going to be good at it. But, um, yeah, it sort of evolved organically, really. Uh, I yeah, remember it's, when you came it's, to Gallagher. It is, it, is, it, is terrifying. it is terrifying not knowing what for some people not knowing what you're going to do. And it is it was me a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you don't strike me as being somebody who gets terrified. I remember when you came to Gala. I remember Gary Parker telling me that this guy was good and he was going to play for Scotland and he told Scottish Rugby that this guy was going to play for Scotland. Now, Gary Parker said a lot of big things and I, I loved him. Yeah, I, I loved Gary. I got on brilliantly with Gary. What what was it that made you get on a boat and come all the way across to play for Gala? Um, it was, in all honesty, <laughs> save your money. Because I was going to come and do it anyway. I was going to come to London with Leah, my wife. She wasn't my wife then, but we we're going to come to London and backpack and, you know, just to have a year out. And then um, I wasn't even going to play rugby at all. And then um, Mickey Donnan, who played at Melrose, he knew Gary. Gary was coaching at Gala and he said, oh, I'll give him a ring and see if he needs a player. And, and I thought, well, that might knock off some of my travel costs. So I'll go there. I didn't, I didn't know I could qualify for Scotland until... I knew my pup was from 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 Govan, but I didn't know that meant I could qualify for Scotland. And and Jason Jones Hughes, you remember at Wales, he played. He was Australian, but played at Wales. So that was ninety, that was ninety seven or early ninety eight, I think. And he played for Wales, and they said, "Oh, he's he's got a Welsh grandmother or got Welsh parent or something." And that's sort of when, yeah, you know, it was in the back of my mind, but it didn't really register. And then you get to the gala, and and um. And the president's like, you haven't got a Scottish granny, have you? And I'm like, well, Pop, yeah, should we go out from Glasgow? And they're like, oh, okay, yeah. So then, you know, it became a bit real, didn't it? <laughs> and then, I mean, you loved it, Gally. You're an absolute hero yeah. there still. What what was it you loved about being there? Because it's pretty different from Manly. Yeah, I mean, Gala Water, Manly Beach, I mean, you know, <laughs> It is a bit different. I, I think it's the same everywhere you go, mate. You know, it's a lot of talk about relationships and in business and stuff, but it's just the people that are there. You know, down to earth, they weren't afraid to say, mate, you were rubbish yesterday walking down, like, walking down Bank Street and you're trying to hide because you lost the game against Dundee High and sneaking in and out of the, the, the shops so no one sees you. But And you don't go in the committee bar after the game because you know you're going to get absolute pelters. Um, I think that's the best part of living. And to be fair, I was 21 with my, with my girlfriend and we moved opposite side of the world and the community sort of takes you in. And I think if I came to a bigger city, then like, we wouldn't st still have friends that we've got now. Like, and well, I wouldn't have had appreciation for, you know, honesty, Scotland and, and the people. If I'd went to the big city, I would have just gravitated towards maybe another expat or something, but, you know, fully integrated the community and, and they take you in. I think that's the best part. The best part of living in Gala, and I'm happy that we we did. And you know, you learn all the all the history with all the border clubs and become part of it. And 
Um, David, David Gray, who is at Hurricanes now, he turned 21 just after I arrived and we had a, it was when Scotland played Wales in the, um, and uh, John Leslie scored that try after about 20 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Um, so he had a bus tour of the borders and a double-decker bus going from pub to pub. I had no idea where I was going or where I was. I was in, I think I was in Austin. So I thought I was about three hours away in Gala. <laughs> And um, that was amazing. That was a really, really good day. But um, yeah, as you can as you can imagine, it got pretty messy. Yeah, and then, and then, then you, you know, played um, some sevens. I did. Yeah, um, I did. One one shot, one kill at Melrose. You know, that, um, there's there's people that have played at Melrose for their entire career and never got a sniff. Wagger rocks up off the boat and wins Melrose sevens in the. <laughs> We had, to be fair, we had Mossy in our team, Kev Amos, or oh, Hovis. That might not have had, you know, helped us, but we had a pretty good team, to be fair. And I think we won the, the cup final the week before, and we just sort of had no pressure on us and, and, and played all right and, and won, really. Um, yeah, that, was a good, that was a good day. How, how many boys in the 2009 British Lions Tour had a Melrose Sevens winner's medal? I don't know, mate. Uh, <laughs> There's a there's a quiz a Thursday night YM I, quiz question. I, I probably think that would just be me. I'm not quite sure anyone else would have. Yeah, I reckon yeah. that'll be you. Yeah, <laughs> that that was my solo there. Did did you get a an agent to go to Edinburgh or did did, did it just happen? No, uh, I had so I was in Gala, and I think Nick Oswald, I think was the CEO at the time. I might have been. Yeah, he just he phoned me and said, "Did you want to come and play for Edinburgh?" And I was like, "Yeah, why not?" <laughs> so I've got so I've got to come back then. <laughs> okay. uh, so Leon and I, Leon and I went on holiday for uh, a little bit, um, and then went home, and then started with Edinburgh in the summer. Did you want um, to be a pro player, or did it just happen? Um, like I always played sport at school. I played rugby league when I was a kid. Played for an NRL club at the time. I think I always wanted to be play sport, professional sport. I mean, every kid does, right? Um, and I wasn't prepared when I switched to rugby and I knew I was coming to the UK to work. That was sort of me thinking, well, maybe that's that ship sailed. And, but it, it kind of did just happen to me. And I think, like, it, it did happen, like I said, organically, but. Um, it, there's just a lot of hard work on the way, you know. I could have arrived in Gala, got got in the got in the steam, and could put on eighty four kilos and lived there for the rest of my life, or gone back to Australia. But you know, I, I tend to think that I, I tried real hard and, and worked at it, and and that's why I went to. Well, it, to be, and it helps having having fifteen guys who are good at what they do as well, like we did in that team, and um, they helped with selection afterwards and stuff. So. Yeah. What did you enjoy yeah. about being in Edinburgh? Did you enjoy being a pro player? Yeah, I did. Yeah, of course. I, I like I like the training. I like be able to. Even now, I still love training. I, I wish I could do more of it. But when you get paid to go to the gym, hang out with guys you you know you want to spend your day with, and then get paid to to be fit and to play a sport you love. I mean, what's not to like about that? Apart from, you know, um, GPS, P testing, um, <laughs> drug tests, um, fat tests, you know, you know, everything. But, but you know, if you're doing all that, if you're doing everything you're supposed to, you know, you know you're right, aren't you? So, which is what I tried to do. Who who is your mates at Edinburgh? Uh, even like the guys now. So, Mossy, Chris Patterson, Mike Blair. We used to hang out quite a bit. Uh, Simon Webster, we used to live not far from each other. I, like, just, he'd, I could see him, I'd see him um, in his kitchen cooking his dinner from where I was, from my flat. Um, yeah, those guys. What's your so. What's your chunk story? Everybody's got a chunk story. Yeah, it's one I can't tell you on here. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got a chunk story. I love the oh, guy. Mate, to be fair, chunk. Well, we were at New Zealand and. Um, it was after I was on tour and he'd been out drinking. <laughs> came down, came down to uh, yeah. Did he come? He came back. I think he came back in the morning. He didn't know what time it was. Went to sleep. Got up. Came down to the came down to the food. 
and realised that um, it wasn't breakfast that he was eating, it was dinner. He goes, you didn't know what time it was. And then um, he sort of looked at me, sat down and looked at me and he's going, mate, what time is it? And I'm like, it's uh, half past seven and dinner time. He goes, what? I thought it was breakfast time. He goes, that's, that's, he goes, that's mint. That means I can go back out. Because <laughs> it was breakfast time, he was going to have to stay in and, and stay in the hotel. But it just sort of an opportunity to go back out in the lash. Um, yeah, there's plenty of junk stories. But, love, you know, just... love, love chunk. So how how does Perpignan come around then? Why why jump to France? Uh, I think so. It's 2005. I mean, 2003. We World Cup. Geach changed. Geach left. Got Matt Williams in. Spent two crappy years with Scotland with Matt, and I didn't. It affected me. It affected me mentally, you know, as like at home and stuff. And I was just not happy. So I said, "Well, to Leanne, exactly what we did before: use rugby as a vehicle to have to for a life experience to get, you know, do something different and make sure because rugby lasts a short time, but." Most most of the time, for me, it lasted quite a while. But if you can use rugby, if you can use rugby to go to a different place, learn a different cultural language, you know, make you a better person. I think then why not? And I think um, that's why we chose France because we, we it was just something different. But the reason why we left is because I just couldn't play with Scotland anymore. I didn't like it. Like I, lo- I love playing with Scotland, but I just couldn't go into camp. I couldn't. I didn't like the 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 culture that was there at the time or the atmosphere. So I just said, look, I, I'm unavailable for selection. I'm going to France because it's just not worth it, which is really hard to say, you know, because that's what you want to do. But um, that's what ended up happening. But we played them in the Heineken Cup. Um, Edinburgh did, got smashed. No, we, we beat them at home. No, we got, they got beat at home. I didn't play. But then we went across to there and they remember they thought I was, okay. I was a decent player and they asked me to go and play for them. So, amazing, amazing time down there. So, did they they asked you rather than go through an agent again, or did you have an agent by this point? I'm an agent then. I think that was the first time I used an agent because I didn't want to stay in Scotland because I would have got called into the, the the Scotland camp anyway. So then you're getting you're getting doubly done over because you're not playing with Scotland because you don't like it, but you've been pulled into Scotland in an environment you don't like because you're in Edinburgh. All guys go for that matter, but. I didn't want to go to England and so I had an agent. I just said, mate, can you have a look around and see what's about in, in France if anyone wants to 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 um to have a slightly funny funny speaking number and second. You give you give yourself a hard time. I love it. Oh, well, why wouldn't you? Don't take yourself seriously, you know. Take your job seriously, not yourself. And then um, Toulouse were interested, but they weren't ready to pull the trigger. But um, Perpignan came back quite early and said, you know, would you like to come play for us? And I was like, yeah. Um, that's how that – I spoke so to hey, Mikko Driscoll was leaving, the oldest-looking 25-year-old I've ever seen. <laughs> he, was, he was leaving, and then I filled his boots, yeah. How, how do you tell Scotland that you're not available? Is, that, is it just as simple as that? You just – had a meeting or sent an email or how do you do that? Uh, well, Geach was the director of rugby at the time. So he went from head coach to the director of rugby and he, he actually called me in and PZ Brown spoke to me as well because they knew I was leaving. And I sort of said, why? And I just told them why. I just didn't like it. And um, I said, so, you I mean, you can make yourself unavailable for selection. You don't have to. You just said, look, I'm unavailable. And that was it. And then Matt ended up, Matt and his crew left anyway. And they got Frank in uh, that summer. And by that time, I told Perpignan you know, I can't play. I wasn't going to play international rugby because Matt, at least for two years, because Matt was in, in situ. And then Frank's on the phone going, mate, you should come back. And I, so I didn't I, I didn't want to go back to my work with Perpignan. You know, so I said, look, for, for now, I can't because I told them I, I'm not playing. And that just made me, you know, I, don't know, I didn't want to do it. It didn't sit well with me. So... Not until I renegotiated my contract with Perpignan um, uh, in February. So they want to extend my contract after the first six months. And I said, look, I've been asked to go back to play for Scotland. 
can I can I do that? And they were like, yeah, okay, we want we want you to stay on, but we, which is more than you going back to Scotland, I suppose. So and then Scott Murray, I wasn't going to go back until the summer, but Scott Murray got red carded against Wales, and then I came back the next game. Yeah, the hero returns. Well, mate, not really. It was sort of um, <laughs> by default, really. If my dad got red carded, join me on the on the band, on the red card list, then uh, <laughs> I maybe would have been back until till summer. <laughs> when, when did you play your best? What what team did got the best out, Heinze? Um, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it goes through phases. Um, it depends what you're talking about. But the, the most disciplined I was was a Leinster. <laughs> um, the um, Claremont. Yeah, I think I think each team got the best of me where I was, but I think I evolved as a player. Um, I learned how to be, I learned how to take a punch and um, be a bit more abrasive at Perpignan. You, know, you know, Edinburgh gave me a lot of um, experience to professional rugby. They eased me into it and... Um, I learned a lot because I hadn't been playing rugby for that long when I came here, I think. So they really laid the foundations for me to, to play, I think, at, uh, at Gala and Edinburgh. Um, let me have, taught me how to be a pro and, and upskill me, I suppose, in, in rugby. And then when I went to Perpy, I just learned how to be abrasive and, and be, you know, kind of people, which I could do anyway, just be an absolute normal. But um, I think it just gave me the freedom to, to do that. And I, as a first sort of team I've been in when we had a pack of, of mongrels really. Um, and obviously as a, as a human, I think I developed, lived in the culture and unknown, learned language and stuff. But um, I learned different skill set, scrummaging and, and all the close stuff. But then um, at Leinster, we pretty much had an Irish team, I don't know, um, apart from me and Ethan Thewa, we should have been all black anyway. Um, they were amazing. So that that taught me about just my own responsibility and how I plug into how I can trust other people and um, to do be good at what they do and help them be good at what they do. Um, and how to have success and not not let the your drive slip away. I suppose because we had a good team, we were successful, but still wanted to be the best. Uh, Claremont, so, sort of a first time I've ever had, ever had to call a line out, probably Claremont. Um, but probably because Scott Murray and Big Al took over um, at Scotland, and um, and I, Leo at Leinster and uh, Perpignan. Well, I think Cuss called the line out to Perpignan, the weirdos. And um, <laughs> then uh, I think that's when I sort of started from when I was at Claremont, like helping, I was older and took more responsibility for. For the team and for the forwards for the line out and and i think that's sort of why it all, all organically grew into being into coaching but um i think they were, they all got the best of me i think oh, there's not one club where they didn't get the best i think the, but just different parts of me developed along the way well what was it like in perpignan as we we're talking before we hit record i came and watched the game and Having only really watched rugby in Scotland, it was a completely different experience. The whole town went red and yellow. The noise was ridiculous. There was no music. There was no pre-match entertainment. It was just gladiatorial between the whistles and the crowd was nuts. What was yeah. that like? I mean, that must have been so different from anything else. Well, considering it came from playing at Meadowbank, <laughs> where the crowd's one side and it's heaps far away from you. Uh, I think, or my side, which is I, I didn't, didn't mind my side really. Um, and then we, where did we finish up playing? Was it in a room? I can't remember. But um, the uh, even look at the cage around the whole, all around the stadiums, yellow and and, um, and red. And even for the warm up, they come and watch on the warm up. We warmed up on the synthetic pitch, which wasn't synthetic then, but pitch outside and you walk underneath the um the stand to go back into this into through the stadium the the main pitch into the change room even then like it was loud like drums there's no no um everyone cheering there's no no program 
you know, no, no fluff around it. It's just we're gonna, you know, try and smash the team that's coming to play us really. And I think the first game we played against Claremont, funnily enough, and um, Scott Robertson was playing and he, he was telling me about his um, his first game. He said, "Oh, mate, my first game. You just want to make sure it's a good one because they, if you get in a the fight, they love you." And, and my first game, I came on as a sub, and they're going, Robertson, Robertson. <laughs> you know, but Paul McCarth in training, but I didn't want to let him down. And um, so I was a scrum just as I got on, and, and um, they were going, Robertson in the crowd. And he goes, I picked up from number eight and tweaked McCarth and had to go back off. So he <laughs> goes, <laughs> the worst thing ever. And then he, had, um, he came back four weeks later and played again. But he goes, it was a bit of a. Uh, a bit of a false start, to be fair, but mine was um, we played Claremont. I remember Perry Freshwater, but Alex Oldeby was trying to who played with Claremont. I was trying to counter up me, and I, I think he just came towards me and I punched him in the face, and then <laughs> and then he just came back again, and punched him in the face again. I was like, and nothing to just play on, you know. And then Perry got the fight, and that was all fight, and never and uh, everyone's happy. No one remember what I did during the game, but I remember that I punched someone twice and uh, got in a fight, so I was. I was accepted, really. And that's what it was. Everyone just wanted you to be, hard, like, aggressive and, you know, it's quite parochial. They don't, it's their patch. Like, it's that's the first time I understood, well, frustratingly as well, that the home and away thing. But, yeah, defended the, defended the home, home patch. Like, you couldn't believe. The same thing happened at Claremont as well. We had, we had 77 games unbeaten at Claremont. Well, I was there. The only game I lost in three years was the, my last game against Cast in the Barrage, which was an absolute pain. But um, yeah, <laughs> the last game. What, why can why can French teams not play away from home? I mean, as a as a comer, that must have been weird. Yeah, it was. I think it's just mentality. I think um, it's different now. Like it's, it's French teams travel now, but at the time, I think. I don't think it was a conscious thing. I think they just like, we're, we're going to defend our our home ground, and then to do that, we're going to. I don't mind if we send give the the first the, the first selection a, a bit of a rest, so we remain unbeaten at home, and then maybe win away, you know, pick up our away win in the end or somewhere. But um, yeah, it's just weird. But that is, I mean, to get the psyche of the French as well, like they think. Um, <laughs> They think when you go play Heineken Cup and it's there's a game at one o'clock, it's a, it's a conspiracy against the French because that's siesta. That's when that's lunchtime, and no one no one does anything at lunchtime. They usually have lunch and sleep, so they think that's a conspiracy against the French, so they don't win. So you're dealing with that, mate. Uh, so, right, tell me, I've always wanted to. I don't think I've ever asked you this. The rumor is that the rugby myth is that you go with the Lions and they all go back to Leinster and say, we need to get this guy. Uh, no. Oh, no. It happened while I was out there. So I left Perpy. Like Geach sort of asked me if I was selected, would I go to the Lions or would I stay for the finals? And I said, this is before the before the announcement. And I said, well, obviously I'd go in lines because maybe I might get another shot at winning the top 14, but probably definitely won't get another shot at playing the lines. I was getting a bit old. And um, so if I selected, I'd go. We met, I got selected. So would, would that have been a decider for him? If you'd said, no, I'm staying for the final, would that have been a, you're out? Uh, I'd imagine so. Yeah, I've not asked him. Um, and then, so I got selected, but then we are meeting at Penny Hill Park in May, middle of May. But that the final, I think the last day, the last day of the round stages had just, were just then for top 14. So I had to go to the club and say, look, I'm off. And I was like, oh, which would be awkward, really. Um, but I understood. And Bernard Guter, who's coach at, um, who was coaching at Claremont, he's coached at Pepeon after, like he understood. But he was just, uh, uh, you know, just disappointed I couldn't be there for the whole lot. And that's not his fault nor mine. It's just a calendar thing. And um, so I was a little bit, in the back of my mind, Chris Custer told them, not that they didn't renew Custer's uh, contract halfway through. They said, no, you're not coming back. This is in January. And they didn't play him from January to the end of the season pretty much. And I was like, well, I've gone away for the Lions. I'm going to come back with a year left my contract. Are they going to 
just let me watch the games for a year. So um, Drico said to me, I don't know how long I was in, maybe I think we're in, who had left yet? I'm not quite sure on timings. If we're already landing, so we're in South Africa, but he said, oh, Mark, check out what are you doing next year. Would you be interested in coming and play for Leinster? I said, mate, you guys are rubbish. I ought to do that. Um, <laughs> and then I said, yeah, mate, look, I, I, I came down and met me and he said, look, I'm going to be here for a year. There's going to be someone else coach, coaching and leave. Would you be interested? And obviously, we they just won the, the Heineken final against Le- uh, Leicester. Johnny Sexton was, was just starting his career. They had, you know, the, the names that they had in their team. I really wanted to win the Heineken Cup, and I didn't know if Perpignan would have the men role to do it. And in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm thinking, right, I'm going to be doing weights and, and watching watching rugby for a year. So I said, I can ask a question. I'd really like to come up, up to the club. So they agreed, and I went to Leinster. So I agreed to go to Leinster while I was on tour and start tour in South Africa. Went home for a, a, a bit in Perpy for about a week. I think after I went to Australia for a little bit because Leanne and Josh, Josh was only six months at the time. Then went back to Australia while I was in South Africa and then um, because mum was ill. And then um, we flew out to Perpy, packed our bags and then went to Dublin. Yeah. Nothing. And what that that's pretty different. You Aussie to Gala in Edinburgh, you then go to France and play Perpignan, and then you end up in Dublin's Fair City. It it must have been an awesome experience to be part of that squad. Uh yeah, it was. Um there's a little bit of a, already experienced a little bit of imposter syndrome in the lines when you look at the players that there. I remember saying at training to myself. I must, must have been really concentrating to be talking to myself during training, which is not unusual, right? Um, I'm looking at these guys and, like, and the way they're training and playing and just how, how quickly they pick things up. I'm thinking, what am I doing here? You know what I mean? I can't exactly go around punching people. That's, that's too old school. So what am, I doing? what am I doing here? And then then I was at Leinster and... You look, you've got like Drico, Darcy, anyway, Owen Redden, Sexto, Jamie Heasley, Keen Healy, Leah Cullen, Shane Jennings, Sean, Sean O'Brien, the Carney brothers, uh, Issa. Um, mate, like it's, it's ridiculous. Dev Tano was there at the time and it's ridiculous. So that's when I can, uh, <laughs> apart from the fact that the first time ever, yeah seen a, a team really really drink but um <laughs> <laughs> some of them anyway but um but they they really enjoy their their company that was the first team really that led themselves out of ownership of their own team you know what i mean checks guided them and but they had enough experience to and like i said before they had success and they didn't want that success to go away but they managed themselves police themselves and created their own culture and that's probably the first team that had pretty much not full ownership but a lot of ownership in their group and that showed because they were so successful yeah i mean and then thing is too they play with each other for so long so long they came up through the academy and they rarely leave they have a they don't have many people in the squad that, to, that come in, so it's it's pretty um, pretty tight knit. So then, it's time to go again. Yeah, uh, IRF, IRF, you didn't want me because I was blocking big Dev Toner apparently. And Joe Schmidt's like, mate, yep, yeah, uh, thanks, but uh, you're not Irish. I was like, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, you got to go. So, uh, which is sport, right? So, uh, Joe came from Claremont. Vern tried to tap me up from Perpignan before, but we're going through IVF at the time and, and, and couldn't really move with Josh. And um, and he said, oh, mate, should I, would you like me to... Vern's already asked me what you're doing. Um, like, if you're going somewhere, would, would you speak to him? And I'm like, yeah, I would. But spoke to Neil McElroy and it was either me or Brad Thorne. Uh, they already started. started they already started speaking to Thorny. Thorny was undecided. He went to Japan, which left, which left the door open for me to go to Claremont. So, thanks, Thorny. And then he, he replaced. He, I replaced him at Claremont. Well, he left the spot open for me at Claremont. Then 
I left Leinster and, and he came in after me. After this, funnily enough, they told me that I was blocking, I was blocking uh, Irish talent. And then I leave and get the breath on in. I don't get it. No, no, I feel like I'm not bitter at all. I no, um, no. Well, you then got to go to Claremont. And so Vern obviously was a big fan because you stuck around with Vern. You were really loyal with Vern for a while. Yeah. Um, one thing, Vern is honest. You know what I mean? Sometimes his delivery is quite brutal, is what he's telling you. And um, I think, you know, I really enjoyed. Him as a person and his honesty and and how and it's not he's not everyone's cup of tea no no doubt but um he helped me a lot and gave me an opportunity to coach and um i haven't like i haven't seen him for a while but um yeah we're on this whatsapp group together which is, is quite funny but uh yeah he was um he knew how to press my buttons you know he's always skip poke, poking me and, and motivating me in a way that he knows how to basically tell me tell me i'm rubbish and i go no i'm not and then go do something better but um but we we just got on well so i think burns quite hard on his on his coaches and his players and i think that if you can um distinguish what he wants from you as a professional and what he thinks of you as a person you know, you're on a you're on a pretty good footing, I think. So, and not everyone can do that. So, you yeah. worked with some pretty impressive coaches. Were you were you pocketing things to use when you became a coach, or no, no, no? That'd be too smart, actually. <laughs> you think really good, wouldn't it? Someone that's, that's sometimes you ask that question. You go, okay, so uh, Jim Geach. Um, but even the, even the crap experiences, like you still learn stuff from, and I, I think I do, I just park it in my brain where it's somewhere. But, um, so like Geach, Jim, um, you know, Andy Robinson was good for, for different reasons. Tooney was there at the time as well. And then, um, like Michael Checker and Joe Schmidt and Vern and I mean, um, had Jacques Brunel end up being the French coach, the Italian coach too. And, um, if yeah, I think if I was smart, I would have made more, paid more attention than just soaking it in. But um, I think I did pick stuff up. I just didn't write it down. I didn't have a conscious, make conscious effort to do it. Yeah. When, does that sound when, like? Does that sound okay? Does it sound? Does it sound like I didn't really listen anyway? So I, <laughs> yeah, which is probably true. When when you look back at career, there's probably only a handful of results you can remember, but you remember people and moments and things what what's the changing room that you enjoyed the most um i think there's a couple really like for a changing room in general like the changing room culture or the yeah the yeah one just one the, the boys the boys you spent times with the moments you had the oh mate i think it's quite like same as a favorite. It's my when people ask about favorite club, I think you have diff, they're all my favorite for different for different reasons, and and that comes from where you are in your life. Like when I was at Edinburgh and Perpignan, didn't have a kid or four like I have now, um, and then I didn't have. Then I had one kid, and, and yeah, it all sort of results are all tied up in that as well. But um, I think. I was lucky where I had every team I had I was in was good, like decent, decent people. I think rugby in general is have that, like have decent humans playing. And, and I think there was only, I couldn't tell you anyone really that I wouldn't like to spend time with in any of the squads that I had. Some of them were lazy, 100%. You know what I mean? And some of them, you, but I, there wasn't any that I didn't want to, share a change room or a bus with you know what i mean so um there are other different cultures and stuff but yeah they're all good when you were on the lions tour were there flares that surprised you either way you didn't think much of them beforehand and then you thought actually he's decent or um i think maybe <laughs> i was quite i was quite um 
nervous going the Lions tour actually because obviously you spend so much time trying to knock the belt, you know, ten shades of whatever out of each other, and then I was somewhat aggressive when I played, and um, I, I didn't know how I'd be received, basically. Uh, but it's fine. Yeah, um, that's the, that's the that's the thing. You just want to make sure, and, and everyone knows. I think that what happens mostly on a pitch is, you know, I didn't spit on anybody or grab anyone's nuts, so. You know, maybe that was there. There was a line, and I stayed this side of it. But yeah, that was quite. I was quite apprehensive, really. Um, but there's no one I thought. You know, this is going to be a bit weird. Well, apart from Rene Gara, because apparently I choked him. <laughs> <laughs> that was that. Sorry, that was a bit weird. I didn't know how Rog was going to take it. And Rog, I expect to. That's the other thing. We're in a bar at Penny Hill Park, and. Um, it was I haven't we went to the Museum of London, had a, a dinner there, came back and instead of having a team building exercise the day after, they just said meet in the bar. So we had a couple of beers and by then Drick was like, So, Rog, how about Heinze uh choking you? Like in the game against the, against Scotland. And I was like, Oh no. <laughs> um, but what happened? I didn't choke him. I thought I may have. Um but I, I, took, I didn't. I didn't choke him. There's no evidence. No evidence I did, Your Honour, either. <laughs> so it, that uncomfortable moment made it more comfortable. Get out in the yeah. open. Yeah, get it out in the open. It came up a couple of times after that in the June tour, but yeah. But that's the thing. You just get it out there and rip the bandaid off. You're okay. I love it. Heidi, you're a busy man and you've got to go. This bit I've not teed you up for. The only bit of this that's scripted, you need to finish the sentence. Happiness is... Apart from egg-shaped. Apart from egg-shaped. So for Heinze, happiness oh, is... Mary. Happiness is... Whoa. Uh... God... Happiness is. I don't know, at, the, at the moment, spending time with my kids. Time with my kids. I think I've been long. I'm, I'm busy, and um, I think just spending time with them and hearing the rubbish chat and how um, it's been growing up. Really, even though, even though they don't know what dad does for a living or you, what you see, you used to do for a living, which is slightly, slightly weird. Do, but, do um, they care yeah. about rugby? Are they interested in? Uh, yeah, they. They do. I mean, Josh. I mean, Josh is six foot two. Uh, he's just turned thirteen, so everyone's interested in him playing rugby. Um, but when we lived in when we lived in Scotland, he played, and then when we went to France, he didn't. But um, um, because the coaching was frankly rubbish, and um, we came back in COVID, and we came back in lockdown. There's no rugby anyway, so start playing football and cricket. But um, his new school is going to. They do rugby, and he's going to. He's going to play there. So um, the others kind of do, but. They, I mean, we live in the like, outskirts of Manchester, so they, they just want to play football. But, yeah. six, six foot two and his old man's Nathan Hines, poor kid. I know, I know. And he <laughs> kind of looks like me, I think. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> no, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, he got tapped up for by the school to play rugby, and he's like, yeah, I'll play. But they didn't really have a rugby team at his old school, so his new school's going to have rugby. And they're, uh, they're already, already sizing him up. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. How he's going to go, but he'll be all right. Nice. His, mom, his mom's going to be a little, a little bit worried when he plays more rugby. Yeah, uh, and you'll you'll be proud as punch on the touchline, just letting him get on with it. Mate, I'd like to say, just um, spend time with kids, make sure they're happy. If he wants to play rugby, play rugby. If he wants to play any sport, no sport, as long as he's happy, then and not doing anything he shouldn't be doing, then they'll be like, they'll be happy. Uh, <laughs> careful, his old man can't turn into a hypocrite. Well, mate, that's the hardest part of coaching, isn't it? Especially when I went straight from playing in a coaching. I'm telling, I don't know, oh, probably, I think probably the worst would have been Ryan Wilson, mate, don't do that. And he's like, mate, you do that every other week. What are you talking about? <laughs> you did it to me last year when we played against you. Stop it. So I had, it was, it was, it was a flimsy, it was flimsy, my, uh, my argument. Did you enjoy yeah. coaching? Yeah, I did, yeah, I did. Like I said, well, I don't think I was very good at it, but um, I enjoyed it. 
yeah. And I mean, when I was in Scotland, I didn't really know much about coaching or anything, but, and I sort of developed a little bit more when I was in, in, in Montpellier, but um, yeah, it was good. I learned, I learned a lot. So even if I didn't write it down. <laughs> Hey, Jay, brilliant to speak to you. Uh, I think we need to have a Nathan Hyde series because I've hardly even scratched the surface. Thank you, my man. No, I've next, absolutely next, loved it. Next time, actually. Yeah. The next time. When you respond yeah. to my WhatsApp messages. Well, there's a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, like, I, like, I like when I say, what time are you thinking? And you give me a day. That's why it gets confusing. <laughs> well, I was narrowing it down for you to then go well no I can't do that day because there's no point in saying 10am because then you might not be able to do it I thought we passed that, you said Thursday and then I said what time are you thinking you said the 31st <laughs> right okay well I'll <laughs> I'll be more specific the next time thank you thank you, <laughs> thank you. good to see you big man see you mate, see you soon Love that guy, and there is so much more to come, but he is busy. Uh, squeeze this in between speaking to his boss and then going off to another meeting. Nathan Hines, absolutely love it. If you've enjoyed it, you can catch us on Apple and Spotify. You can watch on YouTube and Facebook. If you like it, leave a review. Go back and look at some of the past episodes. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. But in the meantime, my name is Bruce Aitchison from the Happiness Is podcast, and my happiness is egg-shaped. I look forward to speaking to you all again very, very soon.